And, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, so what you see in the top left is the symbol of SEALS, the Committee on Earth, Obser Earth Observation Satellites, which is essentially uh, the way the public funded space agencies in the world collaborate through SEALS. And so this, these metadata standards have been uh, developed under SEALS and endorsed by SEALS. So I'm going to show you a time series of satellite data uh, in Morton Bay, where you see Stratbroke Island and Morton Island. And you see uh, data over about 20 or 30 years, where you see the sand banks moving, you see a bit of cloud, you see some kind of differences in the water, but on the land in general, you just didn't see any difference. And this is because all these satellite data have been processed to analysis ready data, which means all the atmospheric effects have been removed, the geom geometric correction has been applied, and a lot of other corrections have been applied in order to make the data uh, comparable so that can, you can use one algorithm for the data, for all the data, all the images, instead of having to process each image. There was just an example, I'll give you one, uh, a few more examples as I go along. So the aquatic reflectance product family statement, PFS is product family statement, which is an official term from SEALS, was done by quite a lot of people from Australia, Geoscience Australia and CSIRO, but also the Joint Research Centre European Communion, uh, uh, Brockman Consulting working on a lot of European Space Agency projects, um, you know, uh, American uh, colleagues, Kent State, uh, universities in Berlin, uh, NASA folks, Belgium, Vito, Netherlands, Water Insight, and Estonia, Tit Kutzer and Italy, Claudio Giannini. The, so you can see this, this was a very international led initiative. So analysis ready data from satellite data. So satellite data have always had the promise of providing long continuous time series, uh, which you can analyze for vegetation or for agriculture or for aquaculture or for coral reef bleaching or for many, many other applications. However, the data from satellites is measured at the top of atmosphere. In order to make and under, sorry, at the top of atmosphere, so the satellites are 800 kilometers above us, they go around at 30,000 kilometers per hour. So they circle the Earth in 100 minutes. And they make a tremendous amount of measurements, but under different light conditions, different solar angles, different skylight conditions. There can be haze, there can be dust, there can be smoke in the atmosphere or can be a very clear atmosphere, there can be sun glint on the water surface, you name it, there are a lot of effects which you all would like to remove so that the data is all becomes comparable from day to day over the years so that you can do long-term trend analysis and change detection. And that's why you need to go from top of atmosphere satellite data to bottom of atmosphere, fully corrected data, which is called analysis-ready data. And then you can better capture the where and when things happen and what happened. And that can help you answer the question of why. Why did it happen and what to do about it? And if you did something about it, did it help? So this supply chain for Earth observation is quite complex. And there's a lot of specialized pre-processing and the data sets are large. The Landsat Archive for Australia, which is one image every 16 days for each location in Australia, over about 35 years now, is petabytes of data. If you have to pre-process all of that data each time you want to use it, that is a completely impossible task. So what you want to do is pre-process the data 
and then make that available either via the cloud or via some other method so that people can select the data and process it further to for their information requirements. And if you have analysis ready data, then the big data aspect of this information can be exploited. So as analysis ready data is a step before you analyze the data for a particular use, be it commercial use or a management use or an agricultural use or recreational use, etc. And this tries to show that if you have analysis ready data and you can process it all centrally to analysis ready data, then multiple users can use that data as they wish. This is implemented in the Digital Earth Australia in Australia. So uh, analysis ready data has now been uh, defined properly. It's generated from raw data and processed so that it can be used without the need for further processing. In the context of water quality, it's systematically, radiometrically, atmospherically, geometrically and spatially corrected full archive earth observation data sets of either normalized water leaving radiance or reflectance. And effectively, when we see color, we see reflectance. The satellites are just much better at it than we are. Interpretation ready data represents derived products. So you use the analysis ready data, then you apply algorithms to go to a water quality, for instance, which I'll show in a minute. And some of these water quality uh, constituents, concentrations we can do nowadays is the total amount of algae or the cyanobacteria, color dissolved organic method, the tannins in the water, transparency, turbidity, etc. This is an example of interpretation ready data made using analysis ready data. And this is Lake Hume and an algal bloom on the 27th of February in 2020. This is 10, 10 meter resolution data. You can see an enormous amount of patterns in the water, different concentrations of algae. And where it's bright green, it's effectively a cyanobacterial bloom going on in the lake. This kind of spatial information is cha can change how we manage our water bodies because the Lake Hume management authorities sample at one or two locations. And as you can see here, they're sampling if it's in the <coughs> north east they will actually shut the lake for recreation and fisheries etc because it's high cyanobacterial content if they sample in the south they'll say the water is fine for recreational purposes but this is the true story which is much more complex just as an example so one of the reasons for having to do this and having to establish these global metadata standards is that at a certain moment multiple providers of earth observation data where for instance uh, there was an example in some lakes in Africa which were in a high demand to get information of those lakes different providers were providing different forms of earth observation data from the same satellite but reaching different conclusions now if you don't know how they process the data you can't compare the results so it's one of the main reasons for saying we must have global acceptable metadata standards because we must avoid confusion with the end users. So this is done to access the very large data sets, but also to make sure that the end users get consistent information, which is really, really important. So I'll now go a little bit into the framework of this Committee on Earth Observation Satellites Analysis Ready Data. And there are product family specifications, which are the full documents. I'll give you an example of one. And in our case, we're looking at one of the optical products because remote sensing of water quality is done by optical earth observation. So this is the definition. It's processed to a minimum set of requirements and organized into a form that allows immediate analysis with a minimum of additional user effort, also very important, and inter interoperability through time and with other data sets. 
then it, satellite data becomes really useful. So how does, the, how does this work? Well, we've set metadata standards and now providers of data can do a self-assessment. There's, there's a whole table for that on the web. They can do a self-assessment, how good they are and how far they reach these metadata standards. Then their self-assessment goes to an international peer review panel and they then verify whether this is correct and then they can get a effectively a stamp of approval that they are compliant. I'm not going to go through all these metadata fields, but I'm trying to give you an idea of what's involved, which is this is the general metadata, which is similar for most Earth observation types, so also for terrestrial and agricultural and geological applications. So these are all the metadata you require, including some actions. And you've got threshold and target. Threshold is that's the minimum. Target is optimum. If you can reach that, that would be fantastic. So the middle column is threshold. The right column is target. In the next slide, I don't have that threshold and target, although those columns are still there. So this is general metadata, which we've been trying to keep as similar as possible for the aquatic, as for the terrestrial and other applications. Then we go to per pixel metadata. So for each pixel, and so we have massive amounts of pixels, petabytes of pixels. For each per pixel metadata, we do want this information. So you also have to look at clouds, of course, because you can't see them, but you also have to look at cloud shadows. You also need a land water mask, but you also, in, especially in Northern Hemisphere, you need sea like and river ice masks, etc., etc. So you have to identify, do you see sun glint at the water surface? Do you see white caps from waves, etc.? Is there floating vegetation on the surface, which can, if you're looking for water quality, those algorithms can't deal with floating vegetation, so you need to flag this. So there are many of these per pixel metadata. Then, really important for remote sensing, you have to do all these atmospheric corrections. So you need to be able to know your water vapor, your ozone corrections, other trace gaseous corrections, carbon dioxide, for instance, or methane, or etc. Um, so you have to do all these corrections as well. And this is a, a more detailed, this is, I'm drilling into just one example where you say, for instance, um, you know, the uh, solar and viewing geometry that the metadata provides average solar and sensor viewing as in the angles, which is quite logical if you think about it. And that, so there are, multiple pages of these kind of metadata that have to be that have have these criteria in them and then the providers will self-assess against them this is lake burley griffin another time series provided by geoscience australia we're looking at total suspended meta levels and you can see the image changing on the left but on the right you see a Huffmiller diagram which gives you along the black transect from the right of Lake Burley Griffin to the left. It gives you the total suspended sediment patterns. And from this, you can actually find uh, weather types when there were lots of floods from 1987 to 1991, 92. Massive amounts of suspended sediment in the lake. The millennium drought is visible from 2001 to 2012, 11. You can see the lake was very clear because there was no major influx of suspended matter. Then you saw in 2010 and 2011, there were large inflow events with lots of turbidity again, and you get high total suspended matter. And then you got a relatively calm period again. And we're now extending this time series to present. And you would see in the last two years, you would see massive increases in suspended matter again. So you can see this kind of data can really be used to provide a lot of information. So the development of this analysis ready data for aquatic reflectance was initiated in March 2020. 
was endorsed uh, one year and three months later. And it applies to very specifically uh, remote sensing data over coastal and inland borders. And the version one is now available from the CEOS ARD website. So you can see there are also analysis ready data products now for surface reflectance, surface temperature, normalized radar backscatter, polarimetric radar, aquatic reflectance, ocean radar backscatter, and nighttime light surface radiance. And many more are in development. European Space Agency is actually beginning to use this to do a self assessment, as is the United States Geological Survey for their Landsat products. Now, we did use the land product family statement for terrestrial remote sensing as much as possible, but we had to modify all these fields because they did not uh, appear or were used for or need to be used in terrestrial remote sensing, but they do are required in aquatic ecosystem Earth observation. So here you see uh, some requirements we had to modify and new requirements that had to be identified. And there are some changes that we had to do uh, in the radiometric and atmospheric corrections uh, as well. So we had to do quite a lot of adjustments. So the effect of all of this is that this is another way to mature the use of Earth observation from coastal and inland borders because there's now a international metadata standards. People, groups that provide this data can now do a self-assessment, which will help operationalize the information. It will aid in the comparison from different providers in what they output. The providers are all going to have to meet this new standard which didn't exist before. And that will lead to trust by end users because they know it, it's now compliant. And the most difficult aspects we have are still the surface um, effects at the water, water interface and uh, effects in the atmosphere, which we still have to work on. And the interesting, I'll get to that later, there's an interesting consequence of this for research. The, these are all some of the issues that we now really have to focus our research on. So having these metadata standards, getting the global community, expert community together, we then actually are identifying the weakest spots in our processing of Earth observation data, which is fantastic because we never had that in such a consolidated way, which of course can lead to research programs with space agencies or research agencies or universities. So it's fantastic. It was an unexpected result that having these metadata standards identifies the area of research and development investment that is going to be needed. And even if we do have the metadata fields filled in for threshold, which is the minimum, there's still quite a lot of research to go to target, which is what would be ideal. So this is an, a, a fascinating consequence we did not even anticipate when we started this process. This is the uh, date page on the CEOS website where you can go to and you can read much more about this. And that's the end of my presentation. Okay.